All right, um, so my name's Raj, and I'm going to be talking to you about how to use React Native to build AR applications. And um, I'm going to start with just a little background on what this, the platform we're going to be using is called Vero, which you know, I'm the co-founder of. And um, a little bit about my background. I've been working in platforms for visualization for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, from 2012 to 2015, I was at Amazon, and we had this problem there where um, we had to write apps for iOS, for Android, and for the web. And those of you familiar with all this, you realize it's a huge waste of resources because you're rewriting a lot of the same code over and over, especially as our clients got thicker. So over there, we turned to using React Native on more and more projects. And um, that ended up being a big time saver. When I left Amazon, my partners and I realized that the same issues are going to plague AR and VR because the fragmentation in this industry is even larger. I mean, you walk into the expo floor, you see you know, five, six, seven different platforms, headsets, et cetera. So it's becoming increasingly difficult to write once and run everywhere um, for AR and VR. And that's the reason we created Vero. And um, this is a platform that is fundamentally an application development platform. It, where it fits in the AR technology stack is it's not a tracking engine. Uh, it uses underlying technologies like ARKit and ARCore to do the um, plane detection, the image detection, and, no, and the SLAM stuff. Um, what it is is a rendering engine that offers everything you'd expect in a rendering engine, a scene graph, physically based rendering, shadows, particles, physics, all of that stuff. So it's most similar in that sense to Unity, in that Unity is the, you know, the dominant cross-platform solution. But the difference lies in Unity being very game-centric, whereas we wanted to build something very application-centric, because the two are very different kind of animals. Games are siloed experiences, whereas apps tend to be ex need to be extensible. They need to open up to the rest to other platforms and, and things out there. Um, so we created two platforms. One is an imperative engine. The other is a declarative engine. And I'm going to focus on the latter today, which is Vero React. And out of curiosity, how many people here have used React or React Native in the past? OK, so there's some familiarity, about half of you. Um, I'm going to go over why React Native is a good choice in general. And the first thing is obviously cross-platform. You write in JavaScript, specifically in JSX, and you really just have to write that once. Uh, it's high, it has native performance. So even though you're writing things in JavaScript, all those commands are executing um, in native code. In Vero's case, it's executing using a C++ renderer that's the same on every platform. So you don't have to worry about um, tailoring things for each one. It'll look exactly the same. The third benefit of React is it allows for fast reloading. You can hot swap your JavaScript files without having to recompile. And that helps a lot, especially in AR and VR, where you have big 3D models and 3D assets. So compiling and injecting all of those binaries onto your devices takes quite a bit of time. It's very useful just to be able to hold up your phone, type in a few things, and then see the changes immediately appear there. Um, Fourth, a nice thing about React and of this platform is that it integrates easily with your existing applications. So you can bolt on AR features onto your existing mobile application. You don't have to um, launch an entirely new app. And it's also easier to pass data from your 2D experience to your AR and 3D experience. And finally, a great benefit of React Native is that it has a declarative syntax. And I'm going to dive into that more now. But the the nice thing about declarative syntax is that it does eliminate whole classes of bugs that you might experience, and it becomes quite a bit more readable. Um, just to back out for a second on the difference between imperative and declarative, uh, most of us programmers are familiar with imperative languages like you know, Java, C++, et cetera, where you have to say what you want, and you have to say how you want to get it. So just to back out of programming, if, let's say you're going to a restaurant. If the whole world operated in an imperative way, you'd go to a restaurant wanting a chicken dinner, and you tell the waiter, can you go into the kitchen, get me the patty from the fridge, and then put it in a microwave? If it turns out right, then put it on the plate and add this thing. You don't do that when you go out. And say you just declare what you want. I want a chicken dinner. And you trust the underlying platform, in this case, the restaurant, to handle all the steps for you. 
going back into the, a common programming example is loading an image on Android, which is kind of like that pseudocode on the left. You would create a URL. You would download it asynchronously. You would handle the success and error conditions and then display the image. With, an, with a declarative language like HTML here, you just say, this is the image I want. Here's the URL for it. And you trust the underlying platform, in this case, the browser, to load that image for you. So how does this um, apply to AR? Let's go over a simple hello world using React Vero and um, see what that looks like. This is the long and short of it. You have a render function. And you see these tags here, Vero AR scene. That says, create an AR scene for me. And then put a text in there and put that text one meter in front of me and use that font Helvetica. So it's fairly straightforward. You compile this, and you end up with, you know, it's not that remarkable uh, hello world sitting over your current view. Um, another kind of trivial example is creating a box and a text next to it. This is another simple thing where here you have a scene. And in this case, this is a VR example. We're adding a 360 background to the scene. That's what the uh, 360 image tag does there. And then you can see we're grouping the text in the box within a parent node. And in 3D graphics, um, this is essentially a scene graph we're creating here. Nodes are the 3D equivalent of views. And you use nodes to lay out components and manipulate components together. And so you run this example, and you end up with the text hovering over a box and a park texture around you. So these are very simple. Not very practical examples. Let's do something a little more useful, like creating a dancing ice cream man on a detected plane. In this case, you need to detect the plane and then put the model on the plane and animate it. First, I'm going to show you what this might look like in an imperative setting using actually Vero Core. Um, this looks a lot like what Scene Kit would look like, too. But you add a listener to a scene, you listen for all the anchors to come in, you say, OK, this anchor is a plane. So is the plane big enough? You, we check if it's uh, greater than one meter and check if it's horizontal. If so, add the model in there and get its animation in play. So this is a classic imperative approach to uh, handling detected anchors and planes. But what does this look like when using React? You can see all you have to do is say, I want a plane. I want it the minimum width and height. And as soon as the underlying platform detects a plane like that exists, it fills in the interior of this tag. And you get your little Iceman FPX model to appear. And it starts rendering. So you can see from this, this is quite a bit more readable and quite a bit more compact. And you're basically giving the platform, letting the platform do things for you. Um, and you end up with this guy. So, um, now I want to run through a more, more complex example. In this example, we have a Tesla logo. When the system sees the logo, it displays a car and a color picker, those spheres. And as you tap on the spheres, you change the color of the car. So there's a few things in this example I want to highlight. One is the lighting. Um, two is the state changes. And three is the actual image recognition. So, this is the code for the thing. I'm going to go over it in bits and pieces. But let's start with the lighting. Notice when the car appears, there's a shadow that you can see underneath the car. And you can also see reflections glancing off the car. This is using physically-based rendering. And to set this up, it's actually very easy. If you have a PBR model, all you have to do is add a lighting environment, like you see in the top, that says treat that environment as the source of all the reflections and the uh, ambient light in the scene, and two, set up a spotlight pointing straight down so that we can display the shadows of the car. So that's all it takes to get the uh, realistic lighting working in this example. Um, the next thing I want to point out is the image recognition. You see the Tesla logo and the car pops up. That part is very similar to what I just went over with planes, is that instead of having to listen for every anchor and detect it's, uh, if it's the right type, you just use a Vero AR image marker uh, tag. And you give it a type to listen to look for. Here it's called logo. Then elsewhere in the program, you 
you do specify that logo means that Tesla logo. So with this code, as soon as that is detected, we'll fill in the spheres and the car. Um, so the next thing to highlight here is what happens, how we actually change the state of the application. Because when you first start doing declarative programming, it all seems very static. There's like HTML, it's just you know, a fixed thing. But there's nothing actually static about declarative programming. And React has this concept called state that helps make things dynamic in your scenes. So in this case, when we load this car here, it's a Vero 3D object tag saying load the Tesla car. And you notice that part where it says materials equals this.state.texture. That's saying bind the material of this car to this variable called texture, which is in our state. And then these callbacks, when you hit the spheres, those just change that state variable. And then React will automatically go through your scene and re-render anything that changed. So React will detect that, oh, the texture state changed. What uses that state? This car does. Let me re-render the car. So in that sense, creating dynamic scenes becomes pretty easy. Um, so these examples are all actually available online. We have some code repositories that have this example on it. And here's another example of a uh, Black Panther jumping out of a uh, uh, movie poster. And you could do a lot more. And declarative syntax to us is very promising, um, especially when you start thinking about the future and you're thinking about things like multiplayer environments, where it'd be, it'd be the syntax for sharing objects. You can just imagine how easy that would be. You just say, like, oh, this is the group I want to share with. Um, and I don't want to sound too positive on this, so what are the, I want to talk a little bit about the limitations of uh, declarative languages. And um, it is a learning curve. If you're used to imperative programming, it takes some time to adjust to a non-object-oriented kind of way of thinking. And also, because you are relying on the underlying platform quite a bit, when you move outside of what the platform is capable of, that's where the learning curve gets a little harder, because you have to learn how to extend the platform, which the good side is, is completely possible. You can write your own components and tie those into the underlying you know, iOS, Android, whatever platform you're using. So these frameworks are all extensible. The learning curve is lower until you try to create new components. Um, but it's a very promising way forward. And um, you can find out more by going to our website here. And I'm happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Go ahead. Um, the question was, is there any other plans for WebXR? Not at this moment, although we have experimented with WebAssembly, and we've gotten you know, things to render online. But for the AR piece, et cetera, there's, we haven't uh, settled on any tracking engine to use for that. But it's something that's always top of mind. Go ahead. Oh, so on our, we have a prototype of rendering on the web, and that uses WebAssembly, which ultimately ties back into WebGL. Uh, go ahead. Oh, right, yeah. So this is for native apps. So if you, what's that? Oh, yeah, the question was, what do you actually need to use this? It's not you know, just run it on the web. Um, this is for uh, native applications on, so things you want to launch on, for example, the iOS or uh, Android app stores. So you'd have a native app. And so you'd write it in React. And then you'd have it working on both AR Core and ARKit with that code base. Yeah. 